law enforcement officers are not above the law. But as several people have already mentioned, I think Dan Bongino is the one who talks about it the most. They're also not below the law. Um, they don't have less rights than Americans, just like they don't have more rights than Americans. And the conviction today of uh, Derek Chauvin, who is the officer who was accused and now is convicted of the murder of George Floyd, I think is a wake-up call for civil, li civil libertarians in the country. And ironically enough, I don't think that it should be lost on anyone, the irony, that uh, now we're looking at the civil liberties of a police officer. Many times we talk about how police officers violate other people's civil liberties because they uh, enforce laws that are unconstitutional or infringe on the personal rights and liberties of the people that they are sworn to protect. Now, I think that generally people have this um, sort of this misconception about what the role of law enforcement is because the definition itself is self-explanatory. They're there to enforce the law. They're not there to protect you. Sometimes the law actually harms you. And we do have an unjust legal system, which is why when you have all these victims groups or these activist groups talking about we need justice and we need equity and everything, uh, that's not the way the legal system is set up. There is no such thing as an objective form of justice because there are two sides to every incident, right? And generally... Uh, you would hope that would be clear which side is in the wrong, but it usually isn't that easy. And I think that the George Floyd incident, his death, uh, which is being ruled a murder, and the, the perpetrator has now been convicted, Derek Chauvin, actually is one of the gray areas because you have a person who was found to be in a very intoxicated state. Um, and in the course of trying to arrest him, he died. And it's clear that the person who was trying to apprehend him uh, didn't have the capability of actually keeping him, him alive. Now, the real question was whether he was the key factor in his death, whether George Floyd would have survived had Jarek Chauvin not taken the actions that he did take. And based on the coverage that I've heard on this trial, I've heard most of it from a foreign source from the Lotus Eaters. Uh, you can say that that's not a good enough source because I wasn't following the trial directly. It was on live TV. But now everybody has the benefit of it. So if you've been watching the trial from beginning to end, you have deeper insight. Uh, maybe you'll disagree with me. But from what I understand, uh, there was reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin was the cause of death in this case, or his actions were the cause of death. I should be more precise. Uh, I would say that based on the audio testimony that I heard, at least several of the witnesses that testified, including some of the witnesses for the prosecution, admitted that he was uh, in a state where he'd ingested too many, uh, too, too large of a dose of fentanyl and had generally a, a, such an unhealthy, um, unhealthy uh, status in terms of his cardiovascular system and other issues that he was going through. That I don't believe George Floyd would have survived whether Derek Shelvin had arrested him or not uh, at the point that it, now if he would have arrived at home and never been arrested that's really the question would he have just been another overdose victim because uh, I do under, I do believe that he swallowed the drugs in order to avoid being arrested as if he was going to conceal them so that's like a different issue whether his arrest as a whole led to his death 
it still doesn't mean that he was murdered. Uh, murder implies that there was intent. Murder implies that there was a um, that there was some sort of direct motive on the part of the person who killed him that would justify the charge. And I'm sorry, but I don't think it was a just charge. I don't think it was a just prosecution. And I don't think that it was a fair trial. The media doesn't agree. The media is actually very happy with what happened. And you can actually see this is USA Today. And I, I think it's, I mean, it's accurate, but it's an admission. They say the media tenses up, then exhales as Jer Derek Chauvin is found guilty of George Floyd's murder. And it goes through the reactions of several people. And in fact, it includes the video of Don Lemon giving some sort of relieved interview to Bernice King, the daughter of MLK Jr. And it goes through Laura, uh, Nora O'Donnell and uh, Lindsey Davis of ABC News and a number of other commentators and people, Fox correspondent Mike Tobin, also in India, Minneapolis, described a similar post-verdict mood in his own way. You have a very happy crowd, and so far, when I hear from random members of the crowd, is they don't intend to bust up the town tonight. Uh, so that, that's that's pretty that's pretty funny. Now there were people who were saying this entire time that. Uh, oh, whether there's going to be a guilty or a non-guilty ver verdict, that there would be riots. Now, I don't think that there's going to be riots immediately, but you can bet that the result of this trial will have ramifications for a while. And one of the ramifications is that police officers no longer will feel the, um, the, the obligation to intervene in some of these very risky situations, which is why, why you kind of have police officers, right? Uh, the, the reason that police officers are a benefit to society, it's not, it's not really a, you know, them protecting you from bad people. That's not really something that they can necessarily do. Uh, in fact, in my community, there was a woman who went on next door and started to talk about how she'd been stalked by a per certain person in a tinted car in her neighborhood, right? We live in a very, um, you know, let me just say a diverse part of the city. And uh, this woman apparently was stalked by a man and he followed her while she was jogging. And then he, she, he would pass by her house on the block every few minutes and it sounds like a compelling case, but when she called the police, they said, oh, there's there's really nothing we can do. And that's really something that they're, they're going to hear about. You're going to hear more and more often now. Maybe before the police would say, well, at least we'll monitor the situation. At least we'll do this. Uh, it's not always possible. And with somebody like Derek Chauvin, and I'm not trying to say that he did a good job because obviously George Floyd did end up dying whether it was Derek Chauvin's fault that was that's what the trial was about um, he did not receive a fair trial uh, and police officers now will see that if they are accused of a crime and their and, and basically the prosecution in their city whether it's a district attorney or if it's a federal officer or whatever, Whatever the case, they are going to decide. Many of these officers are going to say, well, why should I take the risk in order to do my job when I risk going to prison for many, many years? Uh, even if I can get a good attorney through the union, the police union, um, will that attorney be able to represent me in a, in a court where I will get a fair trial? Because in this case, it wasn't. It wasn't a fair trial. I don't think it's any, by any stretch of the imagination, was it a fair trial. There was so much pressure. There was so much publicity. There were uh, elected officials commenting. There were celebrities commenting, professional athletes talking about how he needs to be found guilty. Uh, a sitting congresswoman traveling to Minnesota 
rallying off the crowd, saying that we need a guilty verdict and not just for manslaughter. That uh, environment, which went completely unanswered by the mainstream media, went completely unanswered by the legal establishment and by, um, you know, liberal society in general. And by liberal society, I mean, I mean like the, I, I would say people who are the normal uh, part of society, people who, you know, they mow the lawn and, and uh, you know, they expect their morning paper first thing in the morning uh, every day, that type of person although it's sort of a dwindling segment of society, uh, they largely ignored this and they didn't really let this become a, a cause for them to take up the rights of the accused. And why would they? They want, don't want to be berated by the media. The media, of course, as, as USA Today is reporting, they were relieved that Derek Chauvin was found guilty of George Floyd's murder. And even... You have here, clearly the verdict is supported by the facts, said Fox News host Janine Perot, a former judge. She pointed out that this case was extremely unusual. It's rare you even get a picture of the victim in a murder case. But here we had a living, breathing person that the injury was able to relate to every day, watching the trauma. So that that is something that I didn't expect. Somebody like Janine Perot to go out and say, yeah, this was the, – the verdict was supported by the facts. I'm here to tell you, you know, I, I don't discount the tragedy suffered by families that uh, had their loved one taken away from them, whether it was by being shot by a police officer or, in this case, suffocating while being uh, apprehended by a police officer. I don't discount, discount, discard their pain. I don't try to tell people that it was justified. Uh, I don't think that this was justified. And at the same time, I don't think that Derek Chauvin was guilty of any crime because he was following the procedure. He was doing what the department had trained him to do largely. And he was doing the job that he'd been trained to do for so many years. And if you want to take issue with anything, you should take issue with, uh, first of all, the training. If you find fault with the training and, and they're going to have to change the training apparently now. Uh, they, you should take fault also with the society, the you know the, the broad environment that we're living in, where people are people who are chronically addicted to drugs, to addictive drugs, opioids. Um, that's not really covered as the main issue here. The, the issue of drug addiction. I, I've had uh, at least a couple friends. I, I think I I'm sure two friends who, while I lost touch with them, eventually they died of drug overdoses and it's not like they were terribly close friends but you sort of realize if, if people are dying at a young age this was several years ago that um are in your age range that this could become a, a major problem for society that you know a few people that have died of drug overdoses that that's a major crisis not talked about the media doesn't care it isn't the issue because you can't be mad at a prescription drug or at, at a street drug. I believe fentanyl isn't really uh, prescribed anymore. I'm not even sure, uh, to be honest with you, whether it was ever a prescription drug. I think it might have just been an experimental drug that was abused. Uh, maybe somebody in the comments will know. So I'll, I'll look. I'll check the comments on BitChute later if somebody knows, uh, or I'll just look it up myself. Uh, Fox News Greg Gutfeld, who I think is, I think he has some good white li uh, run line, one liners once in a while. He's a panelist on the Five. He drew an audible rebuke from Perot and fellow panelist Juan Williams when he said, "I'm glad he was found guilty of all charges, and even if he might not be guilty of all charges. I want a verdict that keeps this country from going up in flames." Look, uh, I think Greg Gutfeld said the truth that the USA Today article title suggests but won't admit. They know that America is in a poor state to go through another so summer of roiling riots and, and uh, just chaos. 
and people want to move on from this era of turmoil. By the way, it's an era that started largely under Barack Obama. No, I'm not blaming Obama himself for everything that went on, but uh, the whole reaction to the Trayvon Martin case, the reaction to what happened with Michael Brown, the reaction to what happened in, in uh, Baltimore. I forget the name of the, of the man who was killed. I think it was Freddie Gray, if I'm not mistaken. So the deaths of all these people and the way that the Barack Obama administration uh, largely started to go along with this narrative that police officers are hunting down these uh, black people. That's the way they started to portray it. It's had irreversible damage on the cohesion of the country. And, and especially because it's been used and abused so much by politicians, by political parties, by the media, by people who are filmmakers and, and cultural, um, you know, cultural media people. The, for example, uh, Ava DuVernay and her movie When They See Us. <laughs> Do you think that that movie actually did anything to help the rights of the accused when in this case – Okay, I get it that the roles are reversed. In this case, there's the police officer is in the role of the accused, and um, as opposed to somebody who was picked up by a police officer, I get it that the roles are reversed. I get it that some people might be saying, "Oh, finally, we have a police officer that actually has to face justice," unlike all the people persecuted by the police officer. But Derek Chauvin, when you have this person who he has the entire media against him, he has most of the political establishment against him, the people who are nominally the party of law and order, the Republicans aren't willing to publicly uh, come out and say, look, this guy deserves at least a fair trial. We can't destroy this adversarial system of justice where the rights of the accused and the rights of the victim are, um, you know, they're balanced by the scales of justice. Uh, nobody came to the defense of any of those values, which are, are the real liberal values of the, of the United States. By the way, when I say liberal values, I mean the, the British liberalism, not this um, modern uh, cosmopolitan liberalism that we're living through today that doesn't have any values, that, doesn't, that, that sees fairness as an issue of rectifying uh, past wrongs and injustices for victims as opposed to justice being about... Uh, you know, arriving at a conclusion based on facts and evidence, uh, that really is something that I think should disturb you. And I want you to think about this, right? I am not a person, and I never will be, one of these people who hoists the blue line flag uh, on his porch or anything. I'm, I'm, I don't have an FOP sticker. sticker. I don't really like dealing with the police. Uh, I find them to be generally not very pleasant people. Usually, right, I obviously I've met some police officers who are, you know, completely normal. I served as a military policeman in the Israeli army. Um, wasn't a pleasant experience for me. I would never do it again. Never want to be a police officer. Don't think it's necessarily a position that lends itself to a better society. But there are things that police officers do that people don't appreciate. When you drive through areas where there is heavy construction and a lot of confusion, uh, who is it that is there physically in sometimes very you know dangerous situations in terms of weather in order to direct traffic? It is police officers. Like or not, you might you might think it's a stupid thing to say. Oh, uh, I have to thank them for doing their jobs for, for you know being in a construction zone and so. Look, it is a little bit dangerous for them. I can tell you. And uh, other things that they do when, when you have a car crash, right? Who is the first person on the scene very often? It's a first responder. Many times it is a police officer. When people overdose in their houses and uh, the police are called. Uh, yeah, the police officer often has to administer first aid. Uh, police officers often have to go and rescue um, drowning swimmers. They have to do all sorts – you know, it, it's it's not really a job that it lends itself to social endearment because <coughs> – 
people have this, have this notion that the police are out there to railroad you, to put you in prison for something that is not your doing. But, it, it, you know, that's one issue that, that does happen. I don't think that we should trust every single person wearing a blue uniform right. and a badge to look out for your best interest. I think you have to look out for your best interest. But if we're talking about society's best interest, somebody has to be there to look after, um, you know, some day-to-day safety concerns like construction zones, like administering first aid during car accidents, like, um, you know, cordoning off disaster zones and making sure that people don't wander in and get harmed by them too. And if we become this free-for-all where mob justice gets its way and there is no rights of the accused, if the accused is the wrong type of defendant, then believe me, the, you, you, you think society is unsafe now, it is going to be as unsafe as it gets. It's going to be basically pandemonium. It's going to be dystopia. It is going to be uh, Dante's Peak, right, without the actual lava. And um, I would say, you know, to all you police officers out there, uh, yeah, you should look after your own interests. Us citizens need to look after our own interests. Uh, helping the police doesn't necessarily help you. But directly attacking them also does not help you. You will end up with a society that is, you know, <coughs> a society without the police is infinitely more um, more chaotic and more dangerous than a society with them. And you're going to see, unfortunately, that there, there will be people who they start to realize that there is no um, barrier between them and the threats outside their home. And I'm not talking just about people who naturally would depend on the police. I'm talking about people who, uh, you know, domestic violence victims. Uh, I'm talking about people who are, <coughs> you know, owners of small businesses in some of these poor areas and things like that. And what are they going to do about it? In some cases, they're going to leave their communities, move away. In some cases, they are, they you know, one of these battered women or men, for argument's sake, <laughs> they're going to uh, take the matters into their own hands, you know, get revenge on their spouse without the benefit of the police coming in and resolving the situation legally. The legal system <coughs> is a painful system oftentimes, but sometimes the pain is worth it in order to avoid a greater trauma, a more catastrophic trauma. You know, when a person is arrested for domestic violence, uh, it can often save the life of the spouse. Sometimes it saves the life of the assailant, right? You know, it's, um, it's a real serious situation here. And I think people want to go back to a more joyful time, a time that was more carefree, where there wasn't this pall of anger just hanging all over society and um, the media all the time and, and all these calls for equity and, and um, inclusion and everything. This verdict, the trial that preceded it, the whole circus around it, this is as uninclusive as it gets. A police officer, let me state it again, just as I stated in the beginning. Police officers are not above the law, but they're also not below the law. They have to be, you know, they have to receive the same sort of justice that a normal accused person would get. Uh, obviously, they, they, you know, there's variables that are in, that are attendant to it. People have different attorneys. People have different circumstances involving the crime that they're accused of. So I'm not saying that we that those of us that were expecting um, some a different result. For example, I was expecting more of a split result. He would be ruled guilty. You know, the the verdict would be guilty for manslaughter. It would be non guilty for murder or something. You would go to prison for um, what is it up to a year? Still a problem for him. Um, those of us that were expecting something different. Uh, the reason that we should be especially worried is because we know that the court system is now being held hostage. You can have threats being made against defendants, threats being made against jurors, 
in some cases, threats being made against judges, <coughs> threats being made against uh, witnesses, threats being made against entire cities, um, calls for disturbances and confrontation by members of Congress, and public figures and, and, and all sorts of celebrities weighing in as if it's their job to determine guilt or innocence because, yeah, they were, you know, there were so many people who were trying to say, oh, we, we know what has to happen right now. We know where this has to go. We know where he has to be put, this guy. And the fact of the matter is that if you're not in the jury and if you're not a, a person in the trial and you're doing all these things and you're trying to play with the verdict and the decision, yes, you are contributing to a miscarriage of justice, regardless of whether Chauvin is guilty or not guilty. It is a miscarriage of justice. He deserved a fair trial and he didn't get it. Uh, President Biden, uh, I believe he commented that he was in contact with the victim's family, victim being George Floyd, and you know he knew that the, where the facts were and, and, and what the real... The, the, the proper verdict would be and, uh, you know, suggesting, uh, you know, I think you don't, you don't have to read very hard to, to know that he was suggesting that he should be found guilty and everything. Uh, remember, under, under Donald Trump, um, the media was very bitter about whenever he would comment on pending litigation, especially litigation involving himself. There was a trial that he was going through, I think, regarding a lawsuit with the Trump Foundation. Uh, that that I, I I even think it happened in Minnesota, and he was insulting the judge. He was saying some things about the judge that he was the wrong type of judge or something about him being of Mexican heritage. And to, I think the media ma made a proper judgment at the time that uh, maybe he shouldn't be commenting on pending litigation and and and, uh, and an actual court case that was ongoing, right? Uh, it was a bad idea. It was a bad idea for him as a defendant, as a person who was being sued in that case. But it's even more improper for the president of the United States, who is not involved in the George Floyd trial, who was not involved in any way, uh, to comment on it, to seem to stick to one side as opposed to the other, and therefore uh, skew, <coughs> skew the verdict. That's something that was happening during the trial. And I sincerely hope that there is an appeal. And, um, you know, if, if this is upheld on appeal, uh, so be it. But I don't think that there's going to be anything positive out of this. And if you think that there will be, I want to, I want you to explain why, because how do you bring together communities? How do you make sure that law enforcement is able to do its job while citizens are able to have their civil liberties in a, in a climate where police officers are basically judged, presumed guilty, and until they're found innocent, right? That's the reverse of the system of justice we want. It's the reverse of the system that we want for every citizen, and police officers should be no different, uh, regardless of whether you support the police or not. And I've explained that. I'm not saying this because of the, it's the police, I think they're, they should be criticized as much as possible uh, for the things that they do wrong. But I don't think that they should be, you know, treated worse than the people that they are supposed to be arresting. That's about it. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also find me on all of the alternative media that you see below. And you can also see my newsletter. You can see there's a link to it in the description. And have a great night and stay safe.